Namaste. So we got a great comment from a new viewer just yesterday. And uh, he's saying, you have to have, he's quoting from the video we just released, that you have to have a dream. What is the quality of your dream? And the understanding is that our dreams create our future. They create our senses, our mind, our bodies, due to the process of becoming. So we talked about this. I mean, we've been talking about this since the beginning of this channel, eight years ago. You can look at some of the older videos. Here's one about the process of becoming. And the Buddha called it Paticca Samupada, which means conditioned arising. So what creates the conditions under which we exist and in which we arise and have our being? And of course, it's our thoughts and desires. So, Again, we've gone over this a million times, but people don't seem to understand. So I'm going to put up the good old chart one more time. Here you go. There are four states of consciousness. Dvaita Vada, Vishishta Dvaita Vada, Vivarta Vada, and Dajatta Vada. Or duality, conditioned non-duality, detachment from the material world and the, uh, seeing the material world as unborn. So, and these are the four levels of enlightenment as well. And they are also, each one is associated with a particular type of yoga. Karma, bhakti, raja, and jnana yoga. That's pretty much all there is to know about that. And of course, with the center of gravity of, of our awareness and attention on a given group of chakras. What does this mean in terms of practical living? It means that the dreams, huh? the dream consciousness, we have waking consciousness, which is jagrat, dream consciousness or svapna, deep sleep or shushupti, and finally, awakening, huh? enlightenment. And this is called Turiya. Turiya simply means the fourth, because there's no way to describe it. But the others can be described because they're conditioned by various factors. So the level of consciousness associated with bhakti yoga is svapna or dream consciousness. Think about this for a minute. Bhakti yoga is devotion to a particular form and pastime of the divine, God. Huh? And this can have many, many, I mean, innumerable different flavors and subtle variations depending on individual taste. Nobody, unless you maybe live in a Muslim country, nobody is twisting your arm telling you you have to believe like this or like that. But humanity has lost the plot. Huh? We're told from the beginning of life not to dream. So how can we ever achieve our heart's desires? unless we can dream ourselves into being the type of person who is and has and does those things. You see, this is the art of becoming and it's a part of the science of bhakti. So what do we do in bhakti? Well, first of all, we have an image of the God that we adore. And why do we adore that God? Again, because of that, that deity's particular qualities. And so these qualities are not only 
what we admire, but what we want to emulate, what we want to become like. So there's so many different gods and lords and deities and, you know, you have an infinite choice practically. But the one that you choose is the one you're going to become like. And how do you do that? Well, you make offerings of puja, uh, incense, lamps, flowers, water, all kinds of things that you offer, and prayers, and also mantras. Now, mantra is by far the most powerful process because although you can't, you can't practically do puja 24 hours a day, but you certainly can chant a mantra anytime under any conditions or circumstances. So mantra, especially when it's internalized, in other words, chanted mentally, is the most powerful process because it's unconditional. And by focusing the mind on the particular deity through his or her name, one gradually acquires the qualities of that being. Doesn't that make sense? The Buddha called this Sankara. Sankara means to create a mental image or desire of what we want to become. And then by attaching name and form, words and, and pictures to that idea, then we start the process of becoming. There's a, a feedback loop between consciousness and name and form. That name and form begets consciousness and consciousness begets name and form. We've gone all over this so many times in the past. I'm always surprised that people don't get it or don't understand it. And it's only because they haven't gone back to the beginning and looked at our early series uh, on the playlist uh, page of our channel. But what's got me thinking here is that mankind as a species has <laughs> completely lost the plot. Huh? You know those video games, or and there's even been several movies made like this, where somebody finds themselves in a time loop. Huh? Something happens and they die. And then they wake up like earlier in the same day or something like that. Right? And then they die again the same way. And it goes on and on and on. So what's the natural reaction or response of an intelligent person to a situation like this? It's to try to break the loop. To get out of the determined outcome. Isn't it? So in real life, huh? not in a video game, not in a movie, but in reality, we're in a very similar situation. We're born into this body helplessly, huh? without asking, and then we go through a bunch of pre-programmed uh, karmic periods of life. You, anybody who knows Jyotish, Indian astrology, Vedic astrology, can see this very clearly and predict pretty much what the whole life is going to look like. And then we die. And then we come back again. <laughs> so how do we know how we're going to come back or in what state, in what condition? Well, there's a very great verse in Bhagavad Gita. Yam yam vapismaran bhavam Tyajatante kalevaram, tang tam mevanti konteya sadatad bhava bhavita. That means whatever one thinks at the time of death, that state of being he will attain without fail. Without fail. It's sort of like you're launching off into space, you know? And once you launch off, you can't really change your orbit. So what you think of at the time of death launches you on an orbit to your next 
destination, your next body, your next life, the senses that you inhabit and the quality of those senses and also the quality of the situation that you're born into. So you want to have the highest quality of thoughts at the time of death. So what do we think of at the time of death? Well, it's like the whole life is rewound huh? before our mental eyes. So whatever we've been thinking about our whole life is what we're going to think out at the time of death. Therefore, one should think constantly of the state of being that one wants to attain in the next life. And how do you do that? By mantra practice. <clears throat> now, mantras are powerful in and of themselves. But they become really potent when they're given by initiation. Initiation means you approach someone in the disciplic lineage of that mantra and they give you the mantra in the right ear and then they explain the meaning of the mantra and how to practice it. And in addition, many powerful mantras such as the Gayatri mantra, the Siddhi mantra, the Bala mantra, the Shodashi mantra, and many other powerful mantras have curses on them to protect them from unauthorized use. Otherwise, demoniac people might use them to become really powerful and do terrible things. So because the cursed removal mantras are only available through initiation, this screens out people who aren't serious. And so they get something from the practice of the mantra, but nowhere near the full effect. So one should approach an authorized person for initiation into these powerful mantras and then get the curse removal mantra that clears the curse and gives the mantra its full effect. Huh? This is the secret. Why people don't follow, even though I've explained it a hundred times on this channel, I don't understand. But that's the thing. People have lost the plot. They don't understand that they're in this game situation where they're going to be reborn and reborn again and again and again until they get it. Okay, and now it's Kali Yuga. This is the worst of all the ages, the historical ages. It's described that religion is like a bull standing on four legs. And they are truthfulness, cleanliness, austerity, and mercy. So in the Satya Yuga, the bull is standing on all four legs. And in the Dwapara Yuga, one leg is chopped off by, by Kali, the Sudra. In, in Treta Yuga, two legs are chopped off. And in Kali Yuga, three legs are chopped. So the only leg left is the leg of truthfulness. Because in this age, people have no cleanliness, austerity, or mercy. So truthfulness is the only virtue left. But then we have, you know, elected leaders of great countries who are total compulsive liars, and nobody seems to do anything about it. This is man, you see? So humanity has lost the plot, <clears throat> has completely lost situational awareness <laughs> of what's happening to them. And as a result, they're getting caught up in this endless cycle of rebirth with no possibility of escape. To escape, one has to follow the directions in the scriptures. There is no other way. And the way, the path that's given is very clear, it consists of these four stages. And one must complete each of the four stages. Just like in a video game, you have to complete one level before you get to go to the next, right? And if you try to jump up to the next level before you completed the previous one, you just fall down again. You just have to go through the same tests and the same 
problems over and over again until you finally get it. And that's the way out. That is the key to liberation. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.